Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's webinar, which is called, in a very timely fashion, what the Australian 2019 federal election result means for property investors right now in today's market, which is uh, very important for us to know all this information because it is going to have an immediate impact on the next phase of the property cycle and also consumer sentiment, generally speaking, around property acquisition. So welcome to tonight's webinar. Before I continue on, I just wanted to make sure that you guys can hear me and you can see my screen. If someone can type in, yes, we can hear and we can see your screen, that would be great. Perfect. Thank you very much, Andrew. So a bit of a personal disclaimer before we commence. My results are typical, and I'm not going to insult your intelligence by promising or implying you built a multi-million dollar property portfolio like I have, but I'll show you exactly what's worked for me and give you some pointers on how you can implement similar strategies. And in the event that you find them congruent with your risk profile, investment time horizon, etc., you can accredit me with your results uh, and send me a thank you email. <laughs> But once again, like I always say, there's no guarantees in life and the only person that's going to make you wealthy is yourself. The more information you gain, the more intelligent decisions you'll be able to make. It's literally that simple. Bit of background about myself. For those who have never heard me speak before and this is your first time that you're seeing me at a webinar, I've got a diploma of business management from Monash University. I'm also a real estate agent and a mortgage broker. I started off in the financial planning industry uh, some 20 years ago and then moved on to mainly banking and finance, having run a successful mortgage broking company with 13 full-time mortgage brokers working for me and staff. And also I had a real estate company as well before I set up Investors Prime Real Estate which is what I'm doing now. I'm also a very successful property investor, which is the main reason why I can speak to you about this stuff tonight, because quite frankly, all the certificates in the world do not equate to anything to do with results. And that's why I always say to people, be careful, be wary of geeks bearing formulas. Don't listen to so-called academic experts because academic experts unfortunately end up dead broke and they die alone in Australia with no money. The people that you listen to most of the time are property investors and developers. And I can tell you now from my experience, most property investors and developers that I work with are year 10 dropouts and none of them have any degrees, but they have lots of zeros in their bank accounts. And that's what makes them reliable sources of information. So in the, in the field of stock market investing, in the field of property investing, my experience has always been there's a the direct correlation between your level of education, traditional education, and uh, basically personal development. And it's uh, it's one where the more certificates you have behind your name, the less successful you are. I'm also an author of Australian Property Finance Made Simple, which is the best-selling book now. You can get it on bookonfinance.com.au or Amazon or eBay or any good bookshop out there. So let's talk about what really happened in the Australian property market in 2018-19. If you're not aware, specifically in the Melbourne property market, the peak of the last property cycle was November 2017. And really 2018 and 19 has been a consolidation phase of the property cycle going from the peak of 12 o'clock down to 3 o'clock where we are today. So really the last two years, we haven't had much growth. We've been kind of declining and currently we're at 3 p.m. on the property clock, which I'll cover today and I'll show you the website and information where you can get this information for yourself and verify everything. Unless you've been living on the rock, you're probably aware that we've had the election 2019, which has been very interesting. And I must admit, it was probably the most interesting election that I've really paid attention to in the last 10, 15 years. I'm, I'm really kind of, I've lost interest in politics in Australia, mainly because the quality of leadership in this country, quite frankly, it's embarrassing. Um, I don't mind Scott Morrison, but people like Bill Shorten and these other people, I mean, it's it's just cringeworthy. And this is why I have zero interest in politics. You know, I've, I've always been a liberal supporter since I finished, um, you know, school. But but really, you know, the, the golden era of the Hawke and Keaton um, 
leadership in this country. Really, nothing's happened since. We've, it's just been one disaster after another, um, if you ask me. Um, this is the main reason why Bill Shorten lost the election, in, in my opinion. Um, and this is from stuff that I've read and talked to people and, and other sources of information. But the real reason is that people don't actually like Bill Shorten as an individual. Um, that, that's one of the, he hasn't got the authority or the credibility that a, that a leader should have, in my opinion, number one. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's unfortunate. And you can't create that. You either have the charisma or you haven't got it. Um, and it has nothing to do with your level of education or experience. It's just you're born with it. Um, the second reason is I think Labor is completely out of touch with the aspirational Australian. And Australians are very educated now, especially the younger generation, because of the information they have access to is second to none. I mean, when I was 18, 19, there was no Google search engine. I mean, there was virtually, there was nothing. There was no iTunes. There was no podcasting. There was no webinars. I mean, we're talking about dial-up internet connection and bookshops. So getting information on property investing was very difficult. I remember going to a bookshop and probably one of the best bookshops in, in Melbourne was, was in the city. Um, and I forgot the name of the bookshop now because it's closed down years ago, but it, it had a big personal development business and property section. And there was, in the property section, I think it was about 12 or 15 books and that was it. And after reading all of them, there was really not, not much information I could get from any other source. Now, I mean, it's, it's actually the opposite. Now, the problem is there's too much information. I mean, you just go to YouTube and you type in property investing, there's thousands and thousands of, of experts giving you different strategies. The amount of authors out there now on property investing in Australia, you know, it's probably close to 100. There's probably about three, 400 books written on the on the topic of property investing in Australia. So there's a lot of stuff there. It's actually the opposite now where people get paralyzed with too much information and too many conflicting points of view. But the aspirational Australian is someone that actually wants to own investment properties. And clearly, Labor had policies that were completely detrimental to, to property ownership. In fact, some of the statements they were making during the election was, how is it fair that a property investor with six properties can claim tax deductions on those six properties and others can get into the market? But those people with six properties, like myself, I'm a migrant into the country. I came to Australia when I was nine. I worked my ass off to get my properties. Why don't you talk about the fact that I used to work 60 to 100 hours per week in banking and finance and giving up my weekend to save money, to save deposits and going without? You know, so we could have those investment properties. So now it's almost like I feel guilty for, for uh, you know, working my ass off to have those properties. And that really, I mean, when I heard that from, from the Labor Party, and if you don't like our policies, don't vote for us. Well, that's exactly what people did, Bill. They didn't vote for you. There was also too many policies and not enough clarification on each policy. And I think because there's a level of uncertainty at the moment, generally speaking, with... Um, economically speaking and, and on a global level there is a little bit of uncertainty and consumer sentiment is down i think people voted for against change rather than for change because this is not a time to really initiate major changes to the tax system or capital gain tax or negative gearing or anything like that but i, I felt there was too many policies and for the average person there was enough clarification around how these policies would actually impact the economy home ownership and, you know, majority of Australians, 70% own a home. If there was any inkling of any policy affecting the value of their home, which is the biggest asset they they own, they would probably vote against that. And that's what actually happened. Um, scrapping funding credits, automatically Labor lost all the retired people living on self money super funds because for the average retired person, there were 6,000 to 10,000 worse off every year because the majority of Australians that are retired hold blue chip shares. And I don't understand what the issue is. I mean, someone's already paid tax on these shares. Why do you have to take that away from people? I mean, it was just a stupid policy. And it's almost what well, punishing Australians for owning blue chip shares in banks and, and, and commodities uh, sector like BHP, Rio Tinto and those companies. I mean, I don't, I don't get it. Why would you even do that? Why would you touch anything to do with people that are retired or pensioners. The, the dumbest thing that the Labor government did, and obviously they don't know the history, but anyone that touches negative gearing always loses the action, you know, and this is one of these, these things. Do not touch negative gearing. Um, 
And it's not about negative gearing is not an investment strategy. As I keep saying to people, it's a tax outcome. It's the relationship between gearing and the ability to claim losses from the property against your personal income, which I'm going to cover in a second because I think this is something that's going to come back three years from now when if Labor gets their act together and, and you know, um, there'll be another election. Uh, you know, this is policy that's potentially going to come back again. So I want to make sure that everyone on this webinar has, you know, extreme clarification in their mind about um, what negative gearing is so that you have there's no ambiguity if anything this is a very important topic to cover because you might not have an impact on yourself it doesn't have any impact on me anymore uh, because of where my property portfolio is but definitely for first and second property first time and second time investors as you're building your property portfolio initially in the in the initial stages this is a huge thing and this is the difference between having a property that's cash flow neutral or having a property where you're spending 150 bucks a week maintaining that property. Because for a lot of people, if negative gearing is scrapped, especially lower and middle income earners, they won't be able to get into the property market ever because they won't be able to afford to pay for the losses initially on their property. So this is a big thing that really has lost virtually any savvy property investor, accountants and mortgage brokers that would have voted against Labor without any question because they could see the problems with, with these policies. Changes to capital gains also, I mean, reducing the 50% discount to 25, why? What's the reason? You know, you're getting a lot of money out of out of stamp duty already. Why, why do that anyway? Crazy, lost all the investors, all the accountants, all mortgage brokers, all bankers. Now, remember the biggest contributor to our economy in Australia is the banking and financial services sector. And all these policies have a indirect flow on effect on volume of sales of properties as well as employment. So anyone in lending and mortgages would have voted against labor selection. Anyone in the construction industry as well, um, which they should really represent, they would have lost. Because if you've got a half a brain in your, your trade in the construction sector, I'll show you what the implications are if these policies were to come to fruition. I mean, there would have been massive uh, employment implications as well as a, a massive downturn in construction sector which is a huge sector that employs thousands of people not only that it has a flow on effect to other industries such as white goods furniture everything else you know so there's a, there's a huge sector that will have been affected as well um, this is taken from directly from the labor party's housing policy 2019 now i've realized they've lost the election you might be asking you, you know yourself or myself why are you going through this in detail I just want to go through this once because I want to show you what the implications of these policies would have been. Number two, I want to show you why the Liberals actually won the election, in my opinion. And also, I just want to share with you these points in reference to what the Liberal government is implementing and how it's going to affect the current market conditions. And this is verbatim taken from the website. A shortened Labor government will improve housing affordability and support housing construction by reforming negative gearing and capital gain tax arrangements. All investments made prior to 1st of January 2020 will be fully grandfathered. Great. I don't understand how, just because you say something is going to improve something, where is the link between the policy and the actual market? That's never been clarified. There's no study that shows that negative gearing is going to have a positive impact on housing affordability. In fact, if anything, negative gearing increases rents, which is exactly what happened between 1985 and 1987, the last time the government tried to roll back negative gearing, which was scrapped in 85. Rents went up equivalent to what landlords lost in tax concessions. And then the government had to reinstate negative gearing in 1987. So, you know, the Labor government already learned this lesson in a very harsh way when it was very embarrassing to reinstate legislation because of all this um, feedback from, from, from the community. There's, there's millions of people in Australia, maybe not millions, but hundreds of thousands of people that rent by necessity. and Negative gearing allows private investors to provide housing solutions for people in major capital cities and regional areas who need to rent for whatever reason. Some need to rent because they can't save deposits or they won't have an income to sustain a loan. Some are just there for a short period of time. It could be a student or it could be a subcontractor living in a particular area. So there's a, there's a massive need for housing solutions to be in existence in Australia. And then with Airbnb, um, putting more pressure on the rents, you know, if anything, the government should create more incentive for Australians 
to buy investment properties so they can be self-sufficient at retirement and also to drive rentals down. Because the more investment properties that there are out there, like for for example, the apartment sector, I mean, you never invest in apartments in Melbourne, but if you look at the apartment sector in Dockland South Bank, the rental yields are super low because there's so much volume of supply. So if Labor was really smart, if they wanted to improve housing affordability, they would create policies that would flood the market with stock, you know, which is which is brand new houses, apartments, and, and other policies around, uh, you know, uh, rezoning sections that and, and cutting through red tape and bureaucracy and creating more stock on the market. That's what actually creates housing affordability. Uh, rather than negative gearing and capital gain tax. That punishes uh, you know, people that, that already have property portfolios that want to build larger property portfolios. It doesn't address the current issue, especially with grandfathering legislation. It becomes almost redundant. It's just there's no thought process with this. This is purely some person, some academic at some university that's never invested in his life and he's looking at a bunch of charts and trying to work out what to do. You know, this is the it's just a basic crazy stuff, you know. Um all investments made prior to 1st of January 2020 will be fully grandfathered. Australia currently has the most generous property tax concessions in the world, really. I feel like we're paying about 45% of tax if you add, you know, GST and everything else. That's interesting point of view. Generous property tax concessions mean that first home buyers are being locked out of the housing market. Well, last time I looked, you can still buy a four-bedroom house in Melbourne, it's $450,000. Yes, you can't get it in Malvern. I'm sorry for that. For the first home buyers, you can't get an insurac overlooking the Yarra River, but you can get it 60 k's from the city, you know. But the younger generation says, "Well, we don't want to live 60 k's from the city. That's fine. Then you got to pay for it. That's the reality." Having to compare with investors, having to compete with investors looking for the fifth, sixth, and seventh homes. Well, those greedy investors. Under the Liberals, the cohort of investors with five investment properties is growing at six times the rate of those with one property. That's because they've got the right system for accumulation of capital and because the economy is strong under the Liberal government, not because of any kind of policies you know, that are implemented. I think it, the policies are very fair. You still have to work hard and save money to buy an investment property. Don't, they're making it out like it's almost you know, too easy to do it. Let's talk about negative gearing. I want to cover it very quickly because it's so relevant for this webinar before we get into property cycles and where we are in the property market. Now, last example, last time I did a webinar on negative gearing, I used Bill on 85,000 and Mary on 50. And people said, oh, why is always the males earning more money and why is Mary earning less, etc." So this time, just to be politically correct, because I realize that Australia is becoming a big nanny state and all the minority groups are always complaining, I've chosen a single white female who is, is single by choice and she's making 220,000 per year. Now, she's also not only single, but she's a, a vegetarian. Um, you know what? She's not even a vegetarian. She's a vegan uh, female, and she's also gluten intolerant as well. Single female vegan that's gluten intolerant, making $220,000 per year in income. Now, she owns two investment properties already. One she bought for $450,000, and the purchase, uh, so with current market value is four fifty. dollars and she purchased that property for 300,000. And then she's got a second investment property, which is 550,000 today, when she bought for 450,000. The rental income that she's deriving from those properties is 20,400 per year from property number one and 24,000 from property number two. So the income for both properties is 44,400 per year. Now, before you pay tax on that, you get to claim deductions. And the deductions on these properties are Mortgage repayments or interest only loan payments, I should say, which are 19,200 per year for one and 26,400 for the other. Also, you've got uh, agents' fees or property management fees, 1,200 for first one, 2,160 for the second rates. And then you get to depreciate the building and the fixtures and fittings, repairs and maintenance, and other deductions such as cleaning, travel, insurance, etc. So the total expense for the properties are 34,400 per year for property number one, and 50,560 for property number two. So the total expense for both properties are 84,960 per year. The income, now remember that's a combination of real deductions, cash and non-cash deductions, because Depreciation on capital works, which is building depreciation, is a theoretical deduction. 
it's not a real cash deduction. So you're not actually paying 9,000, you're losing 9,000 in value per year on the building as it depreciates over 40 years at 2.5%. But the bottom line is two properties, they're getting an income of 44,400 and yet they're costing her 84,960 in both cash and non-cash deductions. So there's a loss there of 40,560. Now this is what negative gearing is. Negative gearing is the ability to claim the loss on your property portfolio against your income that you're deriving as an individual. So, so um, Tamika is on uh, 220,000 per year minus the rental loss or the, the loss of um, that she's occurring on her property portfolio, which is 40,560. So her taxable income diminishes from 220 to 179,440. So the new tax payable is 54,520. If she were to have no negative gearing, so imagine she bought this property after, if Labor came into power, and obviously it was a property after the deadline, which was um, next year, her simple tax payable would be just 220, no 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 deductions, so she's paying 73,347. So the difference between get negative gearing and non-negative gearing is 18,822 for her. Now the reality is for high income earners, that negative gearing has no implication for them at all because the constant argument, which is flawed by the Labor Party, is the negative gearing is a tax for the rich. It is not a tax for the rich because, uh, and this is, and I'll show you the stats in, in a second. Um, and it's very interesting because they keep saying that this is a, a tax for the rich and then the middle class and the lower income earners are missing out. Current arrangements for negative gearing and capital gain tax concessions predominantly benefit high income earners. This is from their website. 70% of the benefits of the capital gain tax discount and 50% of the benefit of negative gearing go to the top 10% income earners. The Abbott Turnbull Morrison government spends well over 11 billion a year on negative gearing capital gain tax concessions, money that could be better spent on the Australian schools and hospitals. Independent economists like Sol, Eslake, and international economic um, agencies like International Monetary Fund have called for reforms to Australia's overly generous property tax concessions because they encourage excessive leverage in real estate. This is from the ATO website, and you can see there the first column gives you. Well, the first is a tax bracket, so that's taxable income per year, less than 20,000, 20,000 to 37,000, 37,000 to 80,000, 80,000 to 180,000, and 180,000 dollars plus per year. Then you've got number of non-negatively geared individuals, okay, who don't claim negative gearing. And then you've got a number of negatively geared individuals, those that do claim negative gearing. Now remember, negative gearing has to be paid back <clears throat> when you sell the property eventually. Okay, so even though you're claiming deductions, it's just you're claiming deductions during the ownership of the asset. So if you look at number of negatively geared individuals, those are less than 20,000 per year, represent 204,000 individuals that claim negative gearing and the income is less than 20,000 per year. 179,195 individuals earn between 20,000 to 37,000. So a lot of properties could be bought in regional areas, in areas that are not expensive. The majority of people that do negative gearing or individuals in Australia, which is just under half a million, 499,005, earn between $37,000 and $80,000. And then the second biggest group is 80,000 to 180,000, which is 313,000. And then the 180,000 plus, only 69,615 individuals. If you look at the majority of people, the biggest group of people that actually invest in properties are between 37,000 and 80,000 per year, which is 4.2 million Australians who didn't claim um, negative gearing. So they've got investment properties, but they haven't claimed negative gearing. And this is who the people that <laughs> Labor managed to piss off. The majority of, of the people under 80 grand a year, school teachers, police officers, um, you know, people that work in stores, salespeople, hospitality, you know, they're the people that actually will be even worse off under the new legislation. Ironically, they're the ones that actually need investment properties at their retirement because you want to retire with two or three properties paid off at 65, generating 600 bucks a week in rental. So you can have your 1500, two grand a week and not being reliant on the government pension. So the dumbest thing that Labor did was they penalised their own market, really, 
and this is the craziness of what, this election, that Labor doesn't understand its own market. It doesn't understand. That's why everyone turned against them, because they failed to appreciate these very simple statistics that you can obtain from the ATO that actually show that the dominant group of people that are claiming negative gearing versus the people that are not claiming negative gearing. So this argument that it's a tax for the rich is absolute nonsense. You know, the rich actually do not pay any tax in Australia without negative gearing because they, they've got all this money going through trusts and offshore structures. I know a lot of wealthy developers that are worth, you know, $100, $200 million and they don't pay any tax. You know, the, the, the lower middle class and the middle middle class pay the vast majority of tax in Australia. So what Labor has done is try to punish people teachers on 70 grand a year and police officers for owning an investment property. Oh, heaven forbid they become financially independent at retirement, you know? So it's just this whole victim mentality. I mean, it's, it's just it's just craziness. And this is why I believe they lost the election. They just failed to appreciate their own um, market um, that they're targeting. Labor has a comprehensive plan to improve housing affordability and support housing construction. A shortened Labor government will limit negative gearing from to new housing from 1st of January 2020. All investments made prior to this day will not be affected by changes and will be fully grandfathered. Then also half capital gain tax discounts from assets purchased after the 1st of January 2020. This will reduce the capital gain tax discount from assets held longer than 12 months from 50% to 25%. So if you've got an investment property, you buy it for 500,000, you hold it for 12 months, it goes up to 600, if you sell it, you make a hundred grand. Let's just keep it simple without any fees or agents commissions. 50% of that is 50,000. And then you pay tax on the 50,000. Now you only pay tax um, on the, you only discounted by 25%. So you've got to declare 75,000 as a gain. So this is basically punishing people for holding properties and selling them. But the more people that transact, the more stamp duty is payable to the government. So this is once again a silly policy because if the government wants to raise money, the best thing to do is encourage turnover of stock. The more people trade properties, the more stamp duty is payable to the state revenue office. Therefore, there's more money for the government to spend on schools and hospitals. So this once again is not a thought out strategy by the government. It's it's an, almost an attack on existing owners and then which which kind of is weird because then they've grandfathered the whole legislation um you know so it doesn't affect existing home um investors uh put negative gearing to work by limiting it to new investment properties to help boost housing supply and jobs well you know you're not really doing that at all because it's not addressing the bureaucracy around creating new blocks of land and it's not addressing the supply part of the equation the grandfathering element of our policy applies to property and assets purchased prior to the start date of our policy. This means, for example, that if you own a property prior to the 1st of January 2020, you are able to negatively gear it after that date. The changes to the CGC T discount, capital gain tax discount, would not apply to superannuation funds or the 50% active asset reduction concession that applies to small businesses. The policy will help support housing construction, completing our 10-year plan to support the construction of 250,000 new affordable homes. We'll also encourage more build to rent housing, construction, so more renters can access stable long-term tenancies and more housing in desired locations close to public transport and close to employment opportunities. It's just fairy tale, fairyland stuff, you know. It's so socialist, the whole approach. Uh, it's unbelievable. So which party has a better long-term plan favoring property investors? Absolutely, it's the Liberal government. And it's always it's already been evident in the results of the last election. I mean, the stock market rallied on Monday following the election by 25 to $28 billion, and already consumer sentiment has changed. This is an interesting feedback from the Masters Builders Australian Independent Report from the Masters Builders Association of Australia, who did similar modelling techniques um, that of the former Labor government's Henry Tax Review, which was quite good and forecasted a potential $12 billion downturn in construction activity in the first five years of the policy's implementation. So you got the Masters Builders Association of Australia saying if you implement, if Labor were to implement these policies, if they were to win the election, that is, then the $32 billion plan to end negative gearing for existing homes and slash capital gain take discount would lead to a fall in new housing construction of 42,000 dwellings over five years 
and 32,000 fewer jobs across the country, according to independent modeling of Bill Shorten's key property policies. And look, what's happened already in the property market is because of APRA's intervention, which I'll cover in detail in a second, they've put the handbrake on the property market so hard, it has massively impacted the new construction sector of the property market. And that's why there's an exodus now uh, of tradies that are working on new construction builds all around Australia. And also there's an exodus of real estate agents um, out of the industry because sales are literally down by 60, 70% in some areas, some areas even more. And also there's an impact on mortgage brokers because they're not writing the same volume of loans. So there's a massive flow on effect that has occurred in the last two years. And this is why the property market has eventuated in this part of the, the property cycle. So it's interesting, the people that actually know what they're talking about are saying to Labor, look, if you implement these strategies, it's not going to increase construction, it's going to decrease construction and increase unemployment. Warning of significant contraction to, uh, in housing supply, which could further strain the major capital, Sydney and Melbourne, struggling to cope with population growth. The modelling forecasts a downturn in the housing supply equivalent to accommodating 100,000 people, which is very interesting. The report, based on independent peer-reviewed modelling conducted by Canberra-based Academia Economics, suggested um, that the housing supply already contracting Labor's policy to limit negative gearing to new homes and cut capital gain tax discount from 50% to 25% would, would further accelerate the current downturn in the construction property cycle. So it's already saying that you know you're going to impact the market in a negative way it's already it's already slowing down because of the handbrake's been put on the property market by by really restricting lending policies which i'll cover in a second but this will further you know um slow the market down so we could actually if labor were to win we could have had a recession in this country um or definitely we would have hit the bottom of the, of the market much harder than we are going to in New South Wales, it will deliver a 1.4 billion hit to building activity in the first year, representing a 6% construction uh, in the sector. And this is the, the fallout from the changes from this particular report. And you can see their impact on new housing. And this is uh, what will happen in 2019-20. And you can see that this is the touch housing starts and impact of Australian Liberal Party policy. And then you have a re massive reduction in supply, massive reduction in not only the detached houses and apartments, but look at the loss of jobs or employment in the sector. In Victoria, in the first year, 2,000 jobs, second year, 1,700 jobs. I mean, in New South Wales, 3,600 jobs. So all the people that are associated with the construction industry, they'll be massive, directly would lose their jobs and there'll be a flow on effect. On a national level, in the first 12 months, 8,436,000 ,000 jobs, then 7,000 jobs. And this is this is what will happen. They will just be blaming, you know, if they were to win, they'll just be blaming, oh, it's the global economy. It's, you know, it's the constitution. It's, it's the vibe. Australian Bureau of Statistics figures released in August this year show a 9.4% fall in new dwelling approvals over the previous 12 months. And this is really relevant to investors because Approvals are down because the banks have increased um, the hurdles that you've got to jump through as a developer to get funding and developments off the ground. So now they want higher pre-sales, plus the volume of lending has been reduced. So the LVR for new developments and new construction finance traditionally used to be 70%. Now it's down to 50%. So they've got to put more money into each project and they've got to get 80%, 70% pre-sold before construction finance is released. So that's why construction finance and construction and new building approvals are down and going down further. Um, and they're expected to fall by 25% over the period from 2016 to 2020. And that hasn't changed at, at all at the moment. So you have, you're seeing less and less developments hitting the market, which means there's more pressure on prices on existing stock which is very, very interesting. Um, now, who do I like? Do I like Labor or Liberal? Look, both, I think, you can't trust politicians, you know, long term. Um, that's my my take on it. I'm not really, people see it, see it in different ways, but to me, you know, I think uh, as long as each party doesn't temper with the property market too much, 
and getting involved in the lending sector, then then the property cycles would play out like they've always have played out. Um, but now the game has changed somewhat, which I'll cover. I'll cover some of those topics in a second. So let's talk about the Liberal government. Obviously, ScoMo has won, which is great. It was a surprise to everyone. Uh, I quite like the speech that he did at the end, which was fantastic. Um, why did they win? Really, was it them? Was it that they had such good policies? No, I think it was just people didn't like Bill Shorten and they wanted to remain with the status quo. No change is good. Um, in uncertain times, no change is good. Also, there were potential tax cuts coming and there was no changes to negative gearing um, and there was no changes to capital gain tax. Um, and there was no changes to any franking credits as well. So I think people just voted for the Liberal Party as a protest vote against Labor to a large extent. Um, he also introduced a $500 million first home loan deposit scheme, which is going to have very little impact on, on the property market. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. I think it's a, it's a, it's a negative thing. Under coalition scheme, eligible first home buyers would only need 5% deposit with the government guaranteeing the rest and covering the mortgage insurance under a special loan. What's really interesting th is which is which is unprecedented is that the government in Australia for the first time ever has underwritten an investment sector because when you think about it li listen to what's actually occurred the government is guaranteeing a loan for people buying property have a think how how interesting that is we're in a capitalist free market economy and yet the government is offering to guarantee a portion of your investment into a particular investment market. And that's really a game changer. That means that the government has a lot of certainty about the continuing growth of the property market um, and covering lenders' mortgage insurance under this special loan proposal. The program will be available for some buyers with an income of up to 125000 or couples with joint income up to 200000 and will kick in from the 1st of January 2020. Now it's only 500 million. Is it going to have an impact on the market? I think it's going to have no impact on the market at all. I think what we, it will, it does do is is teach people not to save money and also um, allow people on, on average incomes. Because let's face it, you know, a couple hundred grand in Melbourne per person, it's not that much money. It's average incomes. I think those people they can't save a deposit and stamp duty and I know it's hard to save by the way so I don't want to have I don't want to be you know saying in any way shape or form that it's easy to save money but is it a good thing to leverage someone so high especially with where lifestyle expenses are in Melbourne and Sydney I don't think it's a good thing I think it's going to create more mortgage stress because all those people on those incomes are only going to be able to borrow six hundred fifty thousand dollars max which means they'll be defaulted into the apartment market in, in the city or in the fringe suburbs. And those fringe suburbs are suffering right now in Melbourne because of the leverage. Um, so what impact would the first home loan deposit scheme have on the market? Very little. Um, you know, what it's going to do is put, put pressure on these estates. And have a look at the five postcodes that are currently in mortgage stress in Melbourne. Um, and, and the number one is Wallart, which is north of Melbourne. 20.3% of mortgages there are in, in arrears by 90 days. Then you've got Lindhurst, Lindbrook, Craigieburn, Mickleham, Roxborough Park, Donnybrook, you know, and then you've got um, other areas, Clyde, Clyde North. So you can see there, there's, it's the four growth corridors that we have in, in Melbourne. But is it a good thing to allow people to buy a Metricon home or an A.V. Jennings home or Burbank in those markets with virtually no savings at all, with 5% deposit, I don't think that's a good thing at all. I think that's un irresponsible. I think those people are going to get into real financial trouble because it doesn't teach them how to save money and it teaches them how to just leverage other people's money and then they're going to go in, buy, the, buy their cars and the plasma screens and interest free Harvey Norman's furniture for five years because, hey, honey, you've got five years to pay it off. Easy. Five years come around couple of credit cards, pop out a few kids, they're history. They're going to be leveraged to the hilt and it's going to put them into financial hardship. So I don't think this is a good policy at all. This is a, a very, very 
detrimental policy to a lot of people um, because it doesn't really teach them how to save money. Brian Tracy says, if you have the inability to save money, then the seeds of greatness are not within you. One of the things you have to learn is to go without, and this is the hardest thing. I know it's easy to say, but I did it for years. Um, my wife and I did it for years. We sacrificed holidays and had crappy cars and, you know, um, went without where a lot of people were just spending money willy-nilly. And, but now we're willing to do the things that they won't so we can have the things now that they can never have because after 20 years of investing and compounding, our results are very different from the average person. APRA. APRA is the reason why the market has slowed down. And what APRA did, um, and I want to cover this in detail, is they really put the handbrake on the whole property market. And they put it on so hard that we're still paying for it. And I think it's going to be slow for a number of, of, of years. And I'll show you where we are in the property cycle. So let's go back to 2017. We had a, a really high growth property market and APRA was really concerned. They saw... The majority of investment loans were written every month for property investors. They were interest-only loans. People were leveraging themselves, buying properties. Properties were doing 12, 15, 20% growth per year. And then the government said, right, we've got to do something about this because it's going to go out of it's, it's out of control. So on January the 1st, the banking reg, this is 2017, by the way, the banking regulator, which is APRA, lifted its cap on interest-only loans for investors, and the APRA chairman um, also deemed the speed limit um, introduced in 2017, March, a success. So they realized, yes, we, we really did put a handbrake on, on the property market, and then we're going to lift those regulations, um, which have, they have been lifted now officially, but it's kind of uh, still very, it's still relatively difficult to get a loan. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, APRA's latest banking figures show that demand for investment loans plateaued in 2018 with the major banks combined investment loan books totaling $471.4 billion as of November 30th, 2018, a little more than $471.1 billion a, a year earlier. So they really killed off investment lending altogether. Since the market peak in July 2017, that's national level. In Melbourne, it peaked in November 2017. In Sydney, it peaked in July 2017. Senior home values slid by 11.1%, while Melbourne values 7.2% since peaking in November 2017, according to RP Data Core Logic figures released on Wednesday. Current downturn in Sydney is now the deepest of its downturn since the 1980s according to RP data, which is interesting. So you can see there what happened was, um, and you, if you look at the investment sector, which is a dark kind of, I guess it's blue or green almost, like a, like a deep green blue line. You can see there in 2004, 30%, 31% of all lending was written for interest only loans for investors. So in 94, in 2001, the last property cycle, a vast majority of lending was written for investors compared to owner occupiers, which is the orange line. And then you've got the total housing credit, which is combining them both. And then what happened is in 2004, this is where the, the issue became apparent to the government when they said, look, we've got to do something about it because this cannot continue. So they tried doing different things and eventually the banks were forced to increase their capital adequacy ratios or the amount of funds they on deposit unless they did something about reducing the volume of investment lending down to 10%. And they did. They pressed the button, changed the credit scoring algorithm, changed the banking, the, the benchmark rate for loan assessments, increasing that to 7.25. And that pretty much restricted people's ability to borrow money. And look what happened from 2004 to 2006. It's just a down slope. It was just a line, just bang, right down to 10%. And then they hit it so hard that it just kept going down to 5%, went down to 3% at one stage. So, you know, the goal was really to keep it around the 10% mark. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it kind of, I guess it backfired on, a little bit. Um, and you could see there in 2015, most lenders started announcing tighter investment lending criteria. And then there was also further macro prudential tightening as well in 2017. And this is both national, New South Wales, Victoria, and other states. 
Since 2014, customers have been required to meet interest rate minimum for 7%, but a lot of, look, a lot of lenders actually use 7.25, but most lenders will, will be allowed to set their own benchmarks as long as there is a 2.5% buffer above the mortgage rate. Since 2014, lenders have been required by APRA to make sure potential borrowers can service the loan size at an interest rate of 7%, with most lenders using slightly higher test of 7.25. The regular now proposes borrowers are tested at their own capacity to meet repayments at the prevailing mortgage rate currently at 3.75. So what's going to happen now is APRA has allowed the banks to reduce the 7.25 assessment rate to 3.75 um, without the buffer built in, which is which is insanely good about what's going to happen. Home buyers are set to receive a borrowing boost of, of about 100,000 because of a combination of looming changes in lending standards and the interest rate cuts new modeling shows. A single borrower with an annual income of 80,000, no debt and an average or below living expense could today expect to be approved for a maximum loan of 512. This will increase to 567 under the proposed relaxation of loan serviceability rules flagged by the banking regulator last week, according to modeling of independent mortgage plans. So if you look at a single person, $80,000, if the assessment rate is 3.75%, they can borrow 512,000. If it's 3.25, 598,000, about a hundred grand difference there. If you're at 120 grand as a single person, 811,000. Um, and then you goes up to 949,000 at 3.25. Couple on 80,000, no children, 884,000 at 3.75 and 1,034,000. So that's nearly, you know, 150 grand difference. And couple of 80,000 each, two children, slightly lower. But what it's gonna do, it's really gonna pick up that market uh, where people can borrow 100 to $150,000 more than they could. And I think what's, what you're going to find is as these policies kick in, there'll be a lot of lenders that will take actual loan repayments. Because remember, there's a lot of lenders in Australia, there's 480 something lenders. So a lot of lenders will not only take the default benchmark rate, there'll be lenders which will take actual repayments of what you're paying. So for some clients, you know, you could borrow 500,000 a year ago, and now you could borrow $800,000. The difference could be literally double. Uh, that that could be the implication for a lot of investors uh, at the extreme of the scale. At, at the conservative part of the scale, your borrowing capacity is going to go up by 100,000, 120, 150,000, depending on your income. So is it going to have an impact on the property market? Absolutely will, because for the, for the working white collar professional, your serviceability has gone up and people always buy at the maximum of their borrowing capacity you know, generally speaking. So who's this relevant for? First time investors and upgraders, because now they can buy a better property, especially now with properties in Melbourne losing 11.7% since the peak of the market. There's some bargains out there. So you're going to see a lot of upgraders going in hard and also people buying the first investment property that previously really had no options apart from house and land estates and off the plane apartments. Now they're going to be looking at established property and other options as well. What impact would the APRA's changes to lending standards have on the property market? Huge impact. Once this is implemented correctly, guys, it's the beginning of the next pro growth cycle. Without any question, APRA's changes finished the last property cycle, meaning that they the changes were implemented and we went to a decline. Now that the changes have been re reduced to virtually what they were back in 2011, you know, 12, 13, what you're going to see is is now we're going to be moving through to the next phase of the property cycle. However, remember the market is made up of millions of people and they have to all move and believe the same thing. So consumer sentiment is still very negative. Even though people now can get more money, the majority of people still don't realise that fact because they were rejected on finance six months ago and the perception is nothing's changed. Savvy investors like yourselves listening to this webinar tonight when you go to Loans Australia and get a pre-approval in the next, you know, a month or two, you'll be surprised how much more money you can get now versus what you could have gotten maybe three or four months ago. So there's going to be definitive changes in lending. People will be able to borrow more money, and hence people will spend more money, and that's how we're going to progress in the next property cycle. This is the forecast where we are in terms of property prices. You can see there 
we, I don't think we've hit the bottom yet. Um, you know, and the thing about real estate investing is we're always looking back at data. We're always kind of, um, you know, all the data we get is, is, is two, three weeks old, one month old. And really the best data we get is three months old. So we're always looking back at where we were working out rather than knowing exactly where we currently are. But having said that, looking at all the stats at the moment, which is auction clean rates have increased, um, vendor discounting has been reduced, the days it takes to sell at every house in in the marketplace in Melbourne and Sydney is slightly improving. I think that the bottom is about to happen in the next few months. It could be even at the end of the year. It's not a question of when, it's just a question of, of I mean, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, I should say, it's going to happen. And then there'll be a recovery. And then... When the recovery starts happening and consumer sentiment goes up, the bargains that we have today will very quickly disappear off the market and they'll be gone forever. And you won't see them again for the next six, seven years. There'll be no discounts, no rebates, no stamp duty, nothing. It'll be all just full price. And the stock that's getting created now by developers will be priced at future prices, driving the property market up even further. So you want to get stock that's actually priced two years ago rather than stock that's getting priced today. The Reserve Bank of Australia has also cut rates today by 25 basis points, reducing the bank the bank swap rate to 1.5, uh, 1.25, sorry. So that's further going to fuel interest rates. There's going to be another cut probably next month because we are seeing a downturn in the economy in terms of growth, the GDP, also uh, you know unemployment levels depending on which which major capital city you're looking at melbourne and sydney are fine because majority of people here work in the banking and financial services sector but if you look at the mining sector maybe wa and other areas there's slight increase in unemployment figures um having said that we are literally in unprecedented times currently i mean we're going to see the lowest interest rates you're ever going to see in your life and I think they'll increase eventually as the economy picks up and as we go into the next growth cycle, I wouldn't be surprised if interest rates go up again to slow down the next property cycle. So, you know, we're getting rates now for 3.69%. I mean, if you can't make property work right now, when? Ask yourself that question because it's never going to get this good again. And, and I'm telling you 10 years from now, you're going to be wishing you could come back to 20 you know, to, to 2019 and buy property at the bottom of the cycle. It's going to be one of those moments. I mean, in 91, we had uh, interest rates hitting 17%, which is crazy. I don't even know how people are making repayments. But, uh, you know, now we're, we're literally at the lowest possible level ever recorded in the history of, of since we were capturing data in this country. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. You can buy any property now in Melbourne or Sydney virtually and make it, depending on your income, obviously, and make a cash flow neutral with negative gearing. I mean, and then it then becomes cash flow positive. It, it, it's super simple. And you just buy the best growth area, you know, in, in, in any market. 80% of the growth, guys, is always the suburb. 20% is the dwelling. So if I had to give you the most simplest formula ever is buy the worst house in the best street you can afford to buy into the best possible suburb, and just repeat it over and over and wait. You know, I mean, it doesn't get any simpler than that. The worst thing you can do is pay tax every year and then just sit back and watch the market go up again. I mean, it's such a waste of, of life. Remember that Monday and Tuesday, if you work a five, five day week, Monday and Tuesday, you're working for the ATO. You're giving Monday and Tuesday away that, that to the ATO. Um, that money could be coming back to you into your pocket, into your portfolio. So have a think about that. The Reserve Bank of Australia has two potential interest rate cuts on the cards for 2019, combined with recent announcements by APRA to allow banks to make changes to lending standards and reduce internal benchmark assessments rate from 7.25 to 2.5 minimum will have a substantial impact on the market entering the next phase of the property cycle. I, I know it's the bottom of the market. I don't know exactly when, but I'll know probably in three months from now, because like I said, it's we're always looking back at data. What impact with, with this have, uh, Reserve Bank of Australia future rate cuts? It's going to have a massive impact, not only from a practical perspective of making loans more affordable, and it's going to have a resurgence in positive consumer sentiment. People will see this as a positive. It's already evident in the market. You know, the moment Liberals won the election, the, the, the stock market rallied the next day um, on Monday, you know, 25 billion, 28 billion. 
up. People, I can feel the sentiment changing. The week before the election, there was such a negative sentiment in the real estate and investment sector. People knew that they had a feeling that Labor's going to win. And, you know, Labor thought they had it in the bag because the polls were showing very clear they're going to win. The book is already, you know, I think pricing Liberals at $1.20 and, um, sorry, Labor at one twenty and Liberals at $4. The day before the election, I mean, and on the day, bookies were paying out earlier. I mean, it was just craziness. And there was such negative, uh, you know, uh, sentiment from investors and people in the banking and financial services sector. And then it all changed. So I think for now, we are definitely going to be entering the next phase of the property cycle. The question is, what are you guys going to do about it? This is the thing, because I can tell you now, there's more money made at the bottom of the cycle than any other time in the property market. Anyone can make money at the peak of the market because everything you, you own goes up in value. But it's savvy, educated investors that buy properties at a discount with the right fundamentals at the bottom that make all the money. And this is one of the bottoms. And it's a deeper bottom than we've had in the previous three declines because of different factors that I mentioned before. And this is the reality. Uh, you know, it is going to change. Um, all the experts now that I listen to uh, and respect are saying the same thing. It's a question of just how many months before the market changes. So where are we currently in the property cycle? And this is the company that I always quote, which is Heron Todd White Valuers. That's the website there www.htw.com.au and they create the property cycle and you can see that Melbourne is at 3 p.m. which is a declining market then you have basically 6 p 6 o'clock I should say which is the bottom of the market and then you've got the start of the recovery and the rising market is 9 peak of the market and then you've got the peak of the market at 12. The best time to buy property is Tomorrow, the, no, the best time to buy property is 20 years ago. The second best time is, is yesterday. But if you're going to buy property, don't wait for the market to do anything. I always say it's not timing of the market, it's time in the market. Because buying property is complex. It takes months to buy property. It gets weeks to get a pre-approval. And there's no guarantee that you're going to be buying a lot of property between 9 and 12 o'clock on the property clock. Things could change in your life. Things could change with lending policies and restrict you from buying property. So what I'm saying to you is the best time to buy property to get bargains and discounts is the, during a declining market from three to six. Because then from six, whatever you've bought between three and six, you've got it, if you've got it at a discount, you've got instant equity and then it just goes up even further. So this is something that's important. If you're gonna read one thing a month as an investor, I recommend you read the monthly review newsletter by Heron Todd White Valuers. You can download it from the website for free and start educating yourself about property cycles. But it definitely triggers in the economy that will determine each part of the property clock. And, you know, we definitely are in unprecedented times at the moment, and we are gonna see, you know, really, really good bargains at the moment and areas that are discounted and yet the fundamentals are in, in, in play. So that's where Melbourne is currently. And I think that the distance between three and six on, on the property clock could be six months, could be 12 months. I, I can't see the market continuing as it is into mid-2020. I think by 2020, especially during July, you're going to see a definitive upturn in the property market. But next year, by the end of next year, definitely it's going to change. And I know that because looking at stock on the market, the majority of the stock now, that, especially with brand new properties in, in established suburbs, I'm talking about not in suburbs, there's not much stock on the market, plus the stock that's there already is getting sold up, bought by the by investors, and the new developments that are coming up are being created at a higher price point because land keeps going up in value. So developers have to create new stock at a higher price point. For example, I'll show you some of the examples, but in Footscray, I've got a project that I've sourced where you can get a two-bedroom townhouse for 690000 and I know a developer that's already bought a site not far from there has released in the same stock about six months from now that's that's seven hundred and eighty thousand for the same product, just because the land is costing him so much more than the previous developer who bought it years ago. So very interesting. So when is the best time to buy in the property? Probably when you get the best bargains. I would say between three and six, and definitely at six o'clock. And then it's just it's a game of waiting and going up. 
Now, this decline thing that everyone talks about is very interesting because if you look at this is the historical decline of the property market from the peak um, to 2018. You can see that Sydney went down by 11.7 and Melbourne um, went down. Um, and that's Sydney, basically. Um, and you can see that different times, you know, it went like 2015-16, it's the purple line, negative 3.4, 2010 to 12, the green line, 3.4. The higher it goes up, the the further it goes down because obviously you have to have, uh, the, the market has to be balanced. So, you know, it's funny because people say, well, Sydney went back 11.1%. Yes, but it went up 86% before that. <laughs> It's fine to lose 11.1% for those people who've made 80%, 85% for the previous four years. Don't worry, they're still very happy. You know, um, the media always reports the negative aspect of the market. They never talk about the, the growth of the market. And this is what you've got to be really careful with because the next property cycle is going to be very similar to this property cycle. And you're going to see the doom and gloom of the media always talking about the negative aspect, which is the decline part of the cycle. They never talk about the good part of the cycle, which is the growth cycle, which is where majority of people make their money. If you look at Melbourne, for example, um, this is 2018, negative 10%, but Melbourne has gone up by 80% before that. So yeah, so you went up by 80, you lost 10, you're still 70% better off. It's still very good. I always say to people, long-term perspective, guys, don't focus on the little bumps on the road. You know, median prices in Melbourne and Sydney in May 1980 for an average house, 50 grand. Now, Melbourne, Sydney, 700 to a million. Yes, it goes up and down, it zigzags, but majority of the time the market goes up and sideways. And this is a long-term game. Remember, 1980 wasn't that long ago, um, you know, and prices were $50,000 and people were saying, oh, the market's going to crash and, Market's doing this and market's doing that. It's going to continue to go up as population increases and there's more demand for premium suburbs with access to city water and good schools. Those areas will continue to go up in value. You've just got to be smart about it and keep buying and don't listen to people with no results. Um, And remember, this is this is what the market looks like. The red circles there represent a decline in the property market. And I can tell you now, they were the best times to buy. I mean, imagine having a time machine going back to 1990 and buying properties in Melbourne where you can get an Albert Park detached house for 200000 Who wouldn't go back? And would you care if you overpaid or underpaid? Got it for, instead of 200000 you got it for one ninety. Would that make a difference today if it's worth $1.5 million? Or would you care if you got it for 110000 would that make any difference? It doesn't make any difference long term. So yeah, short term, yes, you can lose money. Um, if you buy, if you pay stamp duty, if you buy agents fees, yeah, you can make you can lose money in the property market. And look, people are always going to lose money in everything they do, whether it's property, shares, businesses. People are always destined to lose money. The, the, I don't believe in market risk at all. I believe in individual risk. You know, you're the risk yourself and, and your risk is based on your knowledge base and how much you know and how much education you have. The more education you have in any particular area, the lower your risk profile, the lower the risk. People that lose money have no education. Perfect example, all the taxi drivers two years ago were buying blocks, house and land blocks in Point Cook, Trigony, Tarnit, and now they're all on Gumtree trying to sell them, except they're all $50,000 under now, so they're going to lose the 10% deposit. There's stout, tens of thousands of blocks now on Gumtree in Melbourne, especially Trigonina, Tunney, Point Cook, you know, um, Packham and Berwick, all the fringe suburbs, and they're trying to offload them and no one wants them. You know, where was the uh, thought process behind that strategy? There was nothing. It's just, it's actually a form of gambling, you know. Um, Melbourne and Sydney have outperformed everyone's expectations in the last 10 years. In fact, and this is what you've got to keep in perspective, that from the GFC 10 years ago, Melbourne has gone up 73.5% and Sydney has gone up 77.5%. And that's what you've got to keep in perspective. Short term, there's going to be volatility, but long term, if you stick to the right fundamentals in Melbourne and Sydney, it's very difficult to lose money, very difficult. And that's why I believe now is probably one of the best times I've seen to buy property and snap up those bargains. 
One thing you're going to see also in 2019 and 2020 is a massive increase in key suburbs in rents. Rents are going to go through the roof uh, in a lot of a lot of different areas. Um, and you know, I did a couple of um, uh, emails about this to you guys. we were showing you the the fastest growth areas for rents that are skyrocketing in Melbourne and Sydney, which is which is very interesting. So what's really going to happen in the property market in 2019 and beyond? Well, I can tell you now, not much will change. And the areas that I really encourage you not to invest in are the so-called growth corridors in Melbourne, which are the dark blue patches of Melbourne. These are the highest stressed uh, postcodes in Melbourne. They're predominantly entry-level white-collar, blue-collar workers susceptible to any economic downturn. If we are going to have a downturn economically, which I don't think we will because the Liberal um, uh, Party in, in, in power now, forming a majority government, which is brilliant, they can actually implement strategy, you know, policies. Um, these are the sectors that I would avoid at all costs, which is basically, you know, places like Trigonia, Atani, Point Cook, north of Melbourne. So avoid anything beyond South Morang, um, you know, any of those areas further up, there's nothing up there. It's 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 just cow paddocks and kangaroos. There's, there's no infrastructure. No one wants to be up there. Definitely Melton, terrible. Anything to do with Melton or surrounding areas. And then the other side, Berwick and Pakenham. You know, it's just a disaster for for capital growth. By the way, I'm not talking about livability, guys. I'm talking about capital growth potential, because these areas have no demand. Um, from high income earners, they and they have. There's no secondary market for these properties. Once you buy it, you can't get rid of it. So it, it's one of these things where, you, where as an investor, you got to stick to the fundamentals, get as close as you can to the city, and especially focus on the southeast and, and the Bayside area of Melbourne. And yeah, there's key suburbs like Williamstown, Yarraville, Brunswick, Carlton, especially they're, they're fine as well. There's no problem. The areas to really avoid in Melbourne, and this is. This is the mortgage stress mapping from mortgage brokers. The number one area um, is Fountain Gate, Nary Warren, Nary Warren South. 5,000 homes, 30, 90 days behind with their mortgage repayments. Berwick, you know, number two, Pakenham, Pakenham Upper, Craigieburn, Roxborough Park, you know, it's the same areas over and over. We know the, the areas, Hoppers Crossing, Tane, Trigonina, 4,000 homes in, in distress. So those people that have bought in it, they've leveraged, something happens to their jobs, they lose their job, they fall behind their repayments. And because there's thousands of them doing the same thing, those properties plummet in value. And therefore, as an investor, if you're holding one of those properties, you've suddenly lost $100,000, $200,000. So these are the areas that I would recommend you stay away from based on the fundamentals. What's driving the whole thing is basically population growth. In Melbourne, in Victoria, between now and 2056, we're going to have 3.3 .3 million population growth, 2.9 million coming to Melbourne. That's huge. I mean, it's 130,000 people per year coming to Melbourne, which is about 40,000 new dwellings that we need. And remember, not all of them want to live in fringe suburbs. A lot of them are coming into established key suburbs. It's a huge growth. So take advantage of this opportunity. These opportunities are rare. Um, if you, if we are currently at the bottom of the cycle, which we, I believe we are, and we'll know in about six months definitively, this is the time to buy property and then wait patiently for the next phase of the property cycle to kick in. Um, it is fairly predictable. It happened before. It's going to happen again. There's no question about it. And the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing, which is focus on the fundamentals. Don't get seduced by buying the wrong property at a brilliant price. I would rather get a average discount on a great property than get a phenomenal discount on a bad property because long term, you're going to pay the price. Real estate prices 25 years from now, average homes in Australia will cost 6.3 million in just 25 years, a study has revealed. Projections show the median prices will reach their figure in Sydney by 2043, up from 1 million and 30,000 today. Aussie Home Loans and CoreLogic RP data survey predicts the average price will hit 5.8 million in Melbourne, 2.9 million in Canberra, 2.5 million in Perth. 2.3 million in Brisbane and the biggest increase in Melbourne, which is going to go up to 5.8 million for an average house. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Like, I can't even believe it. I'm looking at these figures. But then if you go back, 
you can see the cyclical nature of the market. So it's just a question of how many can you buy. If you knew this was 100% accurate, if I was a time traveler and I, and I came back from the future, from 2043, and I said, these are the actual prices of Sydney, Melbourne, and Perth, and Brisbane, and Canberra, and, and Adelaide, what would you do? Would you do everything in your power just to buy, to, to, you know, to buy as many as you can possibly, or would you sit back on the sidelines and watch the whole market play out? And that's really what it's going to be about. Be fearful when others are greedy. Be greedy when others are fearful. Warren Buffett. Top 1% of Australians own more wealth than the bottom 70% combined. Oxfam Australia has released a new report revealing wealth inequality is still on the rise. Oh, no shit. In 2018, and getting worse. Really? People getting poorer and wealthier, people getting wealthier? I've never heard that before. And here's the interesting thing. The report relies on data from Credit Suisse shows the level of wealth held by Australian riches 1% grew to 23% in 20, 2017, up from 22% the year before, with the top 1% owning more wealth than the bottom 70% of Australians combined. It shows wealth inequality in Australia has been on the rise over the past two decades, with the gulf between the amount of wealth held by the top 1% and the bottom 50% now greater at any time over this period. The wealth share held by the top 1% of Australians have been growing almost continuously over the past two decades, while the wealth share held by the poorest 50% of Australians has been falling almost continuously over the past two decades. The best thing to do, guys, for the poor people is not to become one of them. Become wealthy and then give the money away to charity. You know, it's your responsibility to become wealthy, especially if you're a religious person. Even if you don't believe in money, make the money and then give it away to people that are less fortunate than you. Over the decades since the global financial crisis, the wealth of Australian billionaires has increased almost 140% to a total of 115.4 billion last year. Yet over the same time, the average wages of ordinary Australians have increased just 36% and the average household wealth grew by 12%. So the rich are getting richer at a faster rate than any other sector because they keep buying real estate and companies and commercial real estate and keep investing other people's money. The richest 1% of Australians continue to own more wealth than the bottom 70% of Australians combined. While everyday Australians are struggling more and more to get by, the wealthier groups have grown richer and richer. And it's fair, they work harder than anyone else, and a lot of them do massive amounts of charity work as well. And I can tell you real estate ownership is the key determining factor. How much real estate you own today and in the future will determine where you end up and more importantly, where your future generations will end up as well, which is the key thing. So once again, do not invest in these suburbs. Invest there if you want to lose money. Um, but if you want to triple your money in the next 10 years, stick to the fundamentals because there's many areas in Melbourne that have tripled in 10 years' time in terms of medium price. And I've done other webinars on those suburbs. What are the best areas to invest in in 2019 and 2020 for massive capital growth? These are my top. I've done upmarket and, and average suburbs. So number one area in Melbourne is Albert Park, Port Melbourne, St Kilda East and West, Balaclava, Brighton, Bentley, Bentley East, Elwood, Hampton, Sandringham, Black Rock and Balmorris. They're the top 10. So if I had money, this is like pretty much it. Then you have the Andrewal suburbs like Cheltenham Heights, Mentone, Morialic, Aspendale, Edithville, Chelsea, Bombay, Chelsea Heights, and Carrum. So that's, you know, you can get a two better there, 600, 700. Up in the eastern part of Melbourne, Mount Albert, Mount Albert North, Q, Canterbury, Campbell, Surrey Hills, Hawthorne, Baldwin, Baldwin North, and Waverley. Entry level books, Box North, Heidelberg Heights. I love the Heidelberg Heights, especially ex housing commission area. Blackburn, Burwood, Burwood East, um, Mitch and Bayswater, Doncaster, Doncaster East. And here's the thing. Melbourne is having a real estate stock take sale of the decade, and you're all invited. And this is the cool thing. Let me show you some bargains you can pick up right now. And these are properties that I've sourced for my private mentoring clients, and the majority of these properties have been snapped up. This is some of the ones that are left over. You're more than welcome to have them. Saying that the leftover sounds bad, but they're actually identical properties. It's not like these are the worst ones of the batch. Most of these projects, the these townhouses are all exactly the same, so there's no difference between them. This is a development in 
probably the best example of the kind of bargains that you get to see during the bottom of the cycle that you'll never see six months from now. This will disappear completely. I guarantee it. It's not even a question. So this is 711 Barclay Street, Footscray. Great suburb, very close to the city. 19 townhouses, um, 10 have been sold. There's nine left, and there's 700. They're actually 689,950 to 799,000, and they're architecturally designed, so super cool. Um, they will never date because they're timeless classics. Um, this is a typical layout of one. You've got open plan living downstairs with a courtyard, two bedrooms uh, on the first floor, and then you've got another bedroom with an ensuite and a rooftop terrace. Um, they're very cool inside. You can see that it's all architecturally designed. These are not standard design, mum and dad, suburban kind of cheap townhouses. These are really cool. And this is the cool thing about this project, that the cheapest ones, 689,950, which are two bedroom um, townhouses, the developer will pay you a 10% cash rebate at settlement. And there's only two available, and after that he's not doing that anymore, and only because he's got to pre-sell a minimum amount before he gets his construction finance released. So there's two available where if you buy this property and that settles in June next year, you get a check at settlement for $68,995, which is 10%. So you're basically getting your deposit back at settlement, which is really cool. And now $690 is already cheap for Footscray, but this is actually 10% cheaper than that. The reason he's doing this rebate is because he sold them some of them at full price. He can't discount others because he will sabotage the valuations for the previous ones. So in order to discount them, he's doing a cash rebate. The benefit to you as an investor is that you get to buy one of these and when you settle that in June next year, you get to go again immediately or you use the money to pay stamp duty and have 35 grand left over to do whatever you like. So that's a really cool project. If you're interested in one of these, um, give me a call, SMS me or drop me an email, which is on the bottom of the, of the page. Footscray, great suburb, always been a top 20 suburb in Melbourne, always will do well. This is another project in Box Hill North in Thame Street. These are completed townhouses, 100% completed. There's seven of them. There's 795,000. Great location opposite the Box Hill Hospital. We can see there where it's located. Couldn't get any closer, literally across the road from the Box Hill Hospital. So probably you're going to get a doctor or a medical allied professional as your tenant, which is probably the best tenant you can get. It's also walking distance to Box Hill TAFE. Um, and there's a number of private schools that are accessible um, by two minute drive from that particular uh, townhouse. These are a single car garage, open plan living and two bedrooms upstairs. Very good configuration with a small courtyard at the back. Um, there's seven of them and there's two left that are available in the project, 795,000. And on these, um, you'll be able to pick up a $30,000 rebate on stamp duty. I believe stamp duty is about 42,000 on this project. So you only pay 12,000 at settlement and the developer will pay the other 30,000 as, a, as a, a discount. There's only two left, the others are sold and it is 100% completed. So if you are interested in one of these, just send me an email. These are the kind of deals that only exist at the bottom of the property cycle. Once this cycle moves to the next phase and consumer sentiment recovers, forget about any discount. I mean, it's not going to happen, they'll just sell at retail. This is a, also a development that's just about to complete in the 1st of uh, July 2019, so about a month away in Bentley. And these are two and three bedroom townhouses. And once again, with this particular architectural design, very cool. This is a two, uh, three better, um, sorry, a two better. So some of them have, there's different configuration, but the front ones have a double car garage with two um, bedrooms and 2.5 bathrooms. Um, and there's also two bedroom ones. Two bedrooms, two bathrooms are 795. And there is one three bedroom one plus study, which is 1 million and 50. And for these, and they're discounted from the original price of 815 and 1.28 million. Um, so there's a slight discount, but also you get stamp due to kick, kick $30,000 available. There's three left in that project. There are, they're nearly completed. 
they're actually completed 100% now. They just haven't settled, just to clarify that project. But they are actually, there's nothing left to do in, in, in this particular development. So that's also available for you guys to take advantage of. And because I've negotiated the whole development on behalf of my private mentoring clients, you guys can jump in, pick one of these up. And once they're gone, they're gone forever. So I hope you enjoyed this webinar and uh, I'll take questions now. And what the next step? The next step would be for you to educate yourself even further. And I encourage you guys to attend my up and coming real estate investing fast track weekend, which I run in Melbourne. I do about 10 of these per year. Um, about uh, end of January, early Feb to about November. And then I take about a month off, a month and a half off every year and I go on the holidays. So th this is a two-day live event uh, where I educate you on, on, plus a lot of other speakers, on how to build and structure a multi-million dollar property portfolio that can create financial independence for you and your family for the rest of your life. Day one is in the classroom environment where we talk about finance predominantly all day and how to structure your property portfolio correctly. Day two, we put you on the bus and we take you out and we educate you on suburbs in Melbourne, which areas to invest in, which areas to avoid. Uh, it's a two day event. It's uh, only 40 people that are limited to, so they do book out really quickly. And the speakers are myself, obviously, and Stephen McClatchy from Loans Australia and Cameron Fisher from Changing Places Real Estate. And there's other speakers as well from time to time. So if you are interested in attending one of these events, feel free to register just on the link below or go to real estate fasttrack.com.au and I hope to see you at that event and also uh, also if you are interested in getting my copy of my book just jump onto bookonfinance.com.au or Amazon and get a copy either a digital or hard copy of my book best reading you can do as a special bonus section for you guys because you've stayed with me all the way to the end of this webinar I want to give you access to my free home study uh, which is a recording of the fast track weekend online from 2015. Now, what I've done is because it's 2015, I've updated the entire finance section and we, we shot that last year with Stephen McClutchy, which is three hours of new contents. So now it's about 13 hours of contents. Um, you can watch that for free, absolutely no strings attached. And you can, it's literally so easy. You just point and click, videos come up, you download the, the uh, manual, which is about 295 pages, I think. And it's absolutely free, uh, 265 page manual, 10 hours of video, get instant access to it right now. Just click on the link below or just click on this URL as displayed on the screen and educate yourself on how to make money out of real estate investing. It's been a pleasure, guys. Thank you very much for tuning in for this webinar. I hope you got value out of it. And what I'll do now is I'll take some questions um, as well. So if you have any questions, definitely um, this is the time to uh, send me those questions. Otherwise, for the rest of you, thank you very much. And I hope to see you at my future live events. That we have some questions coming through, which is great. Conrad, what about outer east suburbs like Ringwood or Baronia? They're really good as well. Great area, Ringwood and Baronia, um, especially for big blocks. If I was buying Ringwood or Baronia, I'd be buying for subdivision potential. I wouldn't be buying townhouses from anyone. I'll be just buying a big block and just doing my own townhouses. Is it better to purchase a house or an apartment in Melbourne? Never buy apartments in Melbourne. They don't work. Um, definitely detached houses or townhouses only. Hey, Conrad, do you have anything around the 500 mark, first-time investor? Um, yes, but not in a good area. <laughs> uh, there's no such thing as it's not even construction costs for these for these areas. And if it's cheap today, it's going to be cheap tomorrow. You know, the reason why, uh, you know, a three-bedroom, a two-bedroom townhouse now in Melbourne in an okay area to good area is 800,000. A three-bedroom is 1.2 million. You know, so the 500 mark, that ship has, has passed. I do have some options. Um, if you contact me, I'll send you some options for 500,000, but they are not in the top 45 best growth areas. They're in the bottom probably 100 best, best growth suburbs, but they still have potential for 6% growth. Do you have a seminar in Sydney? I, I have just had one last year. Um, sorry, this year I had one. I'll probably run one at, towards the end of the year. I haven't thought about it yet. I'm just so busy with Melbourne people. Um, and it's such a thing to like to have an event up there 
it's a big thing for me. Um, it takes a lot of time out. So I, I do plan to do another one this year, definitely. So I'll make sure that I will send you the link for that. What do you think investing in, in outer cities like Bendigo? Are you able to invest in Melbourne? Yeah, Bendigo is fantastic. I'm a big fan of Bendigo. You get 10% growth in Bendigo as well at a fraction of the price. But obviously Melbourne's Melbourne. You know, like it's, if you can get into Melbourne, get into Melbourne. But if you can't, then Bendigo is definitely an option. Hi, Conrad. Hi. What about Oakley? Oakley's good. Oakley prop has always been good. It's just very expensive now. Um, so it's one of these things where, if, you know, there's probably other suburbs that I would buy before I buy Oakley, but Oakley proper off, off Atherton Road. I'm talking about where the police station is, that old proper Oakley where you have Victorian and Edwardian properties. I mean, that's fantastic, you know. I wouldn't go Clayton North, though, all those areas. $80,000 deposit, where would a good area to invest in? Well, look, that, that I need more information about what you want to accomplish. Um, there's a lot of options there. If you want to email me, I'll send you, and we have a good chat. What about Mooney Ponds, Maribyrnong, Thornbury? Yeah, not bad, definitely. Um, I do a lot of stuff around Thornbury. Uh, I like Mooney Ponds as well. Essendon, Ascot Vale, they're very good areas. You just, just, you got to go bigger there because land is cheaper. So what about Geelong? Uh, no, I wouldn't go to Geelong. Um, I think with Geelong, that ship has sailed and there's not much money in Geelong. I don't see Geelong. It's the opportunity cost of investing one area to another. So I like Geelong in terms of subdivisions because it's very easy to subdivide and build in Geelong. I wouldn't buy and hold in Geelong long term. You can get much better value in Melbourne um, for capital growth. I'm surprised McKinnon didn't catch get mentioned uh, on my tone, McKinnon High. Yeah, they, look, that McKinnon is very expensive now. I mean, a good townhouse is 1.3, 1.4 million. So I don't know if, if McKinnon now is worth looking at um compared to where it was a year ago i think a year ago mckinnon was good but now everyone's jumped on the bandwagon of mckinnon high and they're really just playing that that card too much so i think you've got to be price savvy in mckinnon but definitely school areas school zone areas like mckinnon mckinnon high obviously um in you know parts of bentley uh, that are in a catchment area are worth considering as well geelong again no i don't like geelong what about regional new south wales Bathurst, Orange, Dubbo, uh, not really. If you look at, um, you know, you got to be careful with places like that because the demographic is so average there. People are just not making any money. Dubbo's got all the drug problems and everything else. There's Melbourne prop suburbs like that that are very similar. R what drives property prices is the right demand by the right income demographic. So people with high disposable income who are willing to pay above market for stock and then there's limited stock available. You know, if you're looking at areas that are cheap um, and there's low socioeconomic demographic there with low incomes, those areas are very unlikely to go up in value because people with money don't want to live in those areas. Um, like attracts like. You know, people cluster together demographically in Melbourne and Sydney. That's why there's a difference between the North Shore suburbs of Sydney and the Western suburbs, you know. Um, so I would be very wary of, of areas that are cheap now because if they're cheap now, they'll be cheap tomorrow. And just because something's cheap doesn't mean that you make money on it. Um, it's quite the opposite, in fact. We've had, if you look at an area, look at the last 20 years capital growth history of an area. You know, what has it done? Because in the property market, previous past performance is completely an indicator and a guarantee of future performance, unlike the stock market. So I wouldn't touch those areas, unfortunately. Sunshine is good, but sunshine is transitioning from a very bad area into a, it's not there yet, but I mean, Sunshine Plaza, they spent millions of dollars. You've got the TAFE there. Um, you've got proper sunshine. It's, it's very well located towards the city. It's about 11 Ks, 9 to 11 Ks from the city. Sunshine's got a lot of promise. Look, I was selling Sunshine two bedroom townhouses, 470,000 five years ago and three betters for 520. Now they're selling at 777, you know, 800 for three betters. So Sunshine's already priced at a premium. You know, there's no, there's no cheap Sunshine anymore either. So, um, 
How about Bayswater? Bayswater is only good for um, subdivisions, big blocks, cheap. The, the income, just got to be careful with the demographic in Bayswater because, you know, anything over Baronia Road, like Vermont's good, Vermont South is good, Mitcham's already boomed, right? And Blackburn's obviously very good. But once you go over Baronia Road, right, corner of Canterbury, Baronia Road, over that hill, things get cheap really quickly. So would I buy a townhouse there? No, I would just buy a big block and put two townhouses on it. Would I buy a townhouse in Mitcham? Yes. I would buy a townhouse in Mitcham. Would I buy a townhouse in Vermont? Yes. Would I go Bayswater? No. I would buy a big 900 square meter block and put three townhouses on it. Then you can do well. You know, holding in Bayswater, a townhouse, you're going to get 6% growth, maybe five. You'll be disappointed long term. You're not going to get the growth that you really want. Um, so definitely Bayswater, Croydon Hills, Croydon North, you know, all those Ringwood areas, they're more for subdivision potential. They're not really for buy and hold long term. It's just too far from the city. You're getting the, to that 35K mark, you know. Um, so it's tough. And remember, you want to buy properties where you'll be able to get 7 to 10% growth every year. So they double every 10 years so you can get your deposit out and go it again. You can't afford to buy properties that will double every 15 years. Otherwise, you're going to be 95 before you get start enjoying the fruits of your labor, you know. Hi, Conrad. Really enjoyed your seminar. Re Long-time supporter. Uh, that's from Michelle O'Connor. Thank you very much, Michelle. Hi, Conrad. Uh, what's the capital growth prospect of Croydon? What's the best structure to build my property portfolio? Ooh, that's a very company or trust. Well, look, that's a very important question. I can't answer it now because it's um, – it's not. It's a complicated question. Best thing to watch my uh, YouTube video on trusts, where I interviewed James Black from Branding Co. And then, uh, if you jump onto RP Data, you'll be able to get capital growth on Croydon. You know, for detached houses, predominantly not for townhouses because there's not that data will be all over the place. But for town for houses, you're looking at seven percent growth. It's an area that kind of doubles every 12, 13 years. You know, so it's a good area to develop. What about Gold Coast? Uh, yeah, Gold Coast, you know, is <laughs> – there's no fundamentals in the Gold Coast. I would I would be very – unless I live there and then in the market back to front, I would never touch it. Um, or if you buy an old Queenslander with the subdivision potential or selling it down to a developer eventually, then yes. Would I buy a brand-new townhouse in the Gold Coast? No. There's no fundamentals there. It's just hospitality and tourism. You're much better off going to Brisbane and looking at areas like, you know, Greenslope, Ascot, you know, those areas, um, and buying a townhouse there because Brisbane has fundamentals, diversified industry. Gold Coast is a is a trap for most investors. I mean, never touch apartments in the Gold Coast. If you're going to buy something, I would really research areas that are growing in the Gold Coast, buy a North Queenslander, maybe get it rezoned, flick it to a developer. You know, that's something you could look at. But buy and hold in the Gold Coast, complete disaster. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Great stuff. Um, what your view on Edith Vale, Bond Beach, fantastic. Buy Edith Vale, buy Bond Beach now. It's super cheap. It's Look, people are priced out of Bon Morris and Mentone. Aspendale has already boomed, and Aspendale shopping is just getting better and better. The next is Edith Vale um, and, you know, uh, Aspen, Edith Vale, Bond Beach, Chelsea. Go for it. This is the time to buy those areas and negotiate hard. Try to get in on the beach of the highway because that's where the money is, not on um, Station Street, but Station Street's fine as well, which runs across the train line. Those who don't know, these areas are cut in half by train line. And because most wealthy people that live in Aspen, they either fell Bond Beach, they want to live on the on the beach side of the highway, not the other side because you can't get to the beach. Um, you got to drive. Um, so, yeah, definitely. But Bayside, you can't go wrong. Second blue chip areas, if you can, can't afford 800, absolutely, yes. Uh, what's your best suburb tables applied to establish townhouses as new builds? In short, is there any anything to buy apartments? No, don't buy apartments anywhere that don't work. How about Williamstown? Fantastic. But Williamstown, see, I like Williamstown, and I've sourced properties in Williamstown. The problem with Williamstown is – that Port Melbourne and Albert Park and Middle Park are always going to do better than Williamstown. And what Williamstown does is it creeps up to the same price 
as those areas. And there's more people with more money in Middle Park, Elbow Park and, and Port Melbourne than there are in Williamstown. So you've got to be really careful with Williamstown because if you buy at the peak of the market, you won't get the growth. Long term, fundamentally, it's always been the top 20 best suburbs in Melbourne. There's no question about it. You can't lose money in Williamstown. But what you can do is overpay sometimes because there isn't much left in Williamstown to redevelop. You know, it's all it's all been pretty much done. But yeah, if you can buy something there in your portfolio, it's definitely one of the, the best suburbs to hold long term. Absolutely. Heidelberg West is great. Also, it's a housing commission area. It's rough now. Those housing commission units have been sold up by the government. It's just a question of time before the area becomes a, it's surrounded by some of the best suburbs in Melbourne, which is Heidelberg, Ivanhoe, Eaglemont. So you can't go wrong, you know, and you've got all the access to all the eastern suburbs, best schools in Melbourne. You've got Baldwin and, you know, all the other areas around the corner. So buy Heidelberg West, guys. It's super cheap, really good area for entry-level properties. Brookfield, yeah, it's, it's a, you got to be careful. Uh, do your research. I'll buy subdivisions there. Then I would buy off the plan properties. What's the gross suburb in Sydney to invest in? I don't do Sydney. I'm only a specialist on Melbourne. I'd love to know Sydney better, but uh, I don't. I've done 20 years of research on Melbourne. I know every suburb. There's 418 suburbs in Melbourne. I know every single one of them. I don't know Sydney at all. I don't research there and I don't source properties there, unfortunately. Conrad, do you still pay stamp duty on brand new properties off the plan? Yes, you do. There's no difference now in Victoria whether it's off the plan or established unless you're a first home buyer. 500,000, where can I invest? Bendigo. And Bendigo, like 200 metres from the city. <laughs> I would go Bendigo if I had 500,000. I wouldn't even touch Melbourne. Melbourne, you get a one bedroom apartment. Even just a one better in Glen Iris is 660,000. You know, um, what do you, you can't even get 500 in, in Sunshine for a two bedroom townhouse anymore. You know, so that ship has sailed. Uh, Headfield, which is the closest, cheapest suburb in Melbourne, 11 case from the city, three bedders are going for 660. So, you know, 500 was good five years ago. Now, I don't even, if I had 500, I would go regional, to be honest with you. I wouldn't even buy Melbourne. That ship has sailed for Melbourne. Single title, multiple units in Townsville. Yeah, Townsville, you got to be careful with the mining towns. And, and I know Townsville is very established now, and I've been there many times. Same with Mackay. I like the areas. It's just such a specialised market there. I don't want to comment on it because I don't want to give you the wrong advice. And so, I, you know, I'm a Melbourne specialist. Um, I think Melbourne is the best city in Australia to make money on. It's very predictable and very well laid out. Um, but, yeah, definitely, look, Mackay, Townsville, all those areas, you just got to do your research um, and uh, and go for it. Thank you, Conrad from Alex. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for your time. Thank you. What do you think of Mernda? Disaster. Sell it. Get out of it. Nothing's going to happen. They're guaranteed. Uh, I've got Mernda, by the way, if you want to buy it from me, you're just going to lose money. <laughs> so you know, some people think, oh, you just got nothing in that suburb or, you know, Thanks for addressing my question, Conrad. What are the areas 800 to 850 budget to maximum growth in long term? Clayton, yeah, I don't like Clayton that much. Um, I would go Box Hill, Box Hill North for 800, 880. Um, I will also go to places like um, Chelsea, you know, Edith Vale, Chelsea, Bond Beach, you know. Do you ven do you do venture capital? No, I don't. Uh, and I think that's it for everyone. Any other question, guys? It's been uh, great asking these questions. They're really good questions, very specific. By the way, if you have any specific questions about strategy and stuff, just send me an email um, personally um, to Conrad at Investors Prime Real Estate and I can have a chat to you. Some of these questions, while they might sound simple, they're in context of you and your risk profile and your strategy. So I can have a chat with you um, and get to know more about what you want to accomplish before I can give you advice, you know. So feel free to do that, and I'll, I'll, I'll definitely, um, you know, give you a call and have a chat if you're interested about knowing more. Well, thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure spending this evening with you. I'm going to head off now um, and uh, hope to uh, see you guys in my future live events. And also, um, yeah, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I've got 57 videos now there, hours and hours of contents. 
under Investors Prime Real Estate. So if you want to learn more, check me out on YouTube and uh, keep educating yourself and keep making money. And uh, we'll chat soon. Take care and have a great night.